In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Good and gracious God, we thank you for allowing us to gather this evening. Enlighten our minds and allow us to experience your word. For you are the word made flesh. And through your incarnation, you came into this world to take on our likeness. Allow us to encounter you in a way that only you know because you too have walked this earth. We ask this in your most holy name. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Okay. So, who wants to re do a recap from last week? Who, what, who remembers what from last week? Just do a quick review. Does everyone have the notes, by the way? I got one more. Last one. So who recalls something we learned from last week? The Word made flesh. The Word made flesh, okay. And the, the seven days. The seven days, good. The first chapter of John kind of unfolds over the course of seven days. It's there a little bit implicitly, but it's there. Good. What else? Yes. On the eighth day of creation, there is the new creation, which is... The resurrection of our Lord. And that's what John's gospel is pointing to. Okay. Now tell me something about the context of John's gospel. Who was he writing to? He's talking to the converted Jews. He's talking to converted Jews, precisely. During what decade? How long after Jesus died? 60, 70 years. 90 years. 90. Okay. About 90 AD plus or minus, so about 60 years after Jesus died. So we're going to put John to be in his mid, mid to early 80s. That's how old he is, roughly. Okay? Good. Anything else? How is the Gospel of John structured? Has anyone started to remember their chapter listings? We can say that the Gospel of John is broken into two sections. What are they? The book of signs and the book of glory. Okay, good. Good. Now, what is the overall... Well, this kind of applies to all four of the Gospels, I guess. But in a special way. What is the point of the Gospel of John? That Jesus is God. That Jesus is God. And he, there is no doubt that Jesus is God. But as a corollary of that, as a sub-point, what's next? So yes, John is saying Jesus is God. He comes out the gate saying that within the first sentence or two. And the Word is made flesh. And the Word was God. What's another name for John? The beloved disciple. And therefore, because he is the beloved, there is something unique about the connection that John had with Jesus. I don't know if I said this last week. But if you've ever had a deep, intimate relationship with someone, a personal friend, that gives you greater context for what the lens in which John is writing. Think about somebody who's in war and who has their best friend or brother. Actually, let's step back a second. I don't watch many movies, but I've seen one movie in like the last five years. I don't know if any of y'all have seen it. Has anyone ever seen the movie, what's the name? 1917? Came out about two years ago? Okay. You see that connection about those two brothers had, that bond? It was intimate and it was strong and it compelled him to act. It compelled him to do something. Take the Gospel of John through the lens of a relationship like that and then times it by infinity. And then allow that guy 60 years to reflect, digest, and chew on that relationship. And then moved by the Holy Spirit, John sits down and writes his gospel. That gives you a, co a, a context for the entirety of what's called the Johannine Corpus. The Johannine Corpus refers to all the books that are written by John the Evangelist. And in 
the scriptures, there are five of them. The, the pinnacle one is obviously the Gospel of John. And then there are three letters that are attributed to John. They're very short. And then anyone know what the fifth book of the Bible that's attributed to John the Evangelist? The book of Revelation. And to understand that book, you first really have to understand the Gospel of John. Because you got to start to make the connections. Else, when you read the book of Revelation, it's, it doesn't make any sense. Okay. All right. Moving on. Before we go through the notes, I'm going to open the floor. Who did their homework? Good. Tell me something that you picked up. Something that, a takeaway. Nothing too elaborate, but what's something new that you learned, I guess? Yes. That Jesus in John's gospel does not baptize. It is the disciples. Good. That's really good. Anything else that you've never read? How about, is there a story that you read that you never knew was in the Bible? Yes. You're getting to a good point. What he's picking up is the fact that the Gospel of John doesn't necessarily unfold in the same sequence of events as the Synoptic Gospels. So if you go back and say, read, this is why we probably should have did Mark first or Matthew. But if you go back and read those, they kind of give you a more <laughs> sequential order of events. In John's Gospel, he's not too, he's not too concerned necessarily about the order of events. He cares more about the events in themselves, and he places them in a certain order, not necessarily to give you a history lesson, but to walk you through the intimacy of Jesus. He's building up to something. That's really good, because when you read this, it kind of unfolds a little bit differently. You read the first couple chapters, guess what's not there? Christmas? There's no Christmas story. There's no him being found in the temple. There's no calling of the twelve individually. There's none of that. It's different. Absolutely. That's fantastic. Yes. I thought it was interesting that they say, well, he can't be the Christ because he came from Galilee. And we know who his parents are, Joseph and Mary, basically. And in the other gospels, when they says that he's in Nazareth and he gets driven out of town, but here in this gospel, he's not in Nazareth when that happens. He's in a different place and happens twice after. That's really good. Pay attention as you continue to read John's Gospel to location. Location is very important. The geography of John's Gospel is a little bit different. He doesn't spend too much time in Galilee. He spends time in Cana, Samaria, and Jerusalem. And Jerusalem is key because Jerusalem ties it back to what type of people? The Jews. And you're going to see that a lot in, in the the, the notes that I scribed out for today. Good. Anything else? Anything funny that you picked up? That was comical. Because at first, there's, John's gospel is filled with personality and comedy. And some great one-liners. I have the notes right here. Did you not get them? Oh, yeah, no, these are today's notes. Uh, I can, they're on the website. So if you go to catholicquero.org and scroll down to link, Everything's on there. Copy of the videos on there, and the notes are on there from last week as well. Okay. Um, where was I? The funny things. Anything funny that you picked up? There's some good comedy, like the money changers, the woman at the well. She said she had a husband. He said you have five. 
five you have had five husbands. Yeah. He calls her out. That was pretty brazen. Very brave. Oh, it gets even better when you start to actually get into what was being said. Or when he goes and he hears the official son, and the official comes to him, and he's like, Okay, uh, you only want this because you want to see so you can believe. He's pretty curt in some of, the, uh, some of his responses. Jesus' responses are pretty curt. Or even the wedding feast at Cana. He's like, what does this concern me? Why are you bothering me? And then he calls her a woman. Which in our modern ears has a different connotation. But even then, by calling her a woman, he obviously didn't call her a mother. And there's a reason behind that. Very good. Anything else? Pardon? There we go. That's the bookend. We'll get to that in a second. Very good. Okay. Any questions thus far? Kind of broad questions? Not necessarily particular questions about the chapter and verses, but anything broad, any broad questions about John, who he's writing to, what he's trying to accomplish, uh, when he wrote, anything like that? Any clarifications that we can do? Okay, so we don't have time, obviously, to reread line by line all four chapters. But I do want to read a little bit of it, because um, it does help. So we're going to read The Wedding Feast at Cana, and we're going to read The Woman at the Well. And we're going to try to go through it all together and what's in between. But those are the ones that I really want to, to focus on for today's class. Okay, so let's go to chapter 2, which is The Woman at the Well. Remember... In last week's notes, I gave you an outline of the events of John's Gospel. I am still really encouraging y'all to read or to, to try to memorize or become familiar with the order of John's Gospel. It is extremely helpful. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So, the Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. On the third day, there was a marriage at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus, was also, Jesus also was invited to the marriage and his disciples. When the wine failed, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, O oh woman, what have you to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now six stone jars were standing there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, Fill the jars with water. And they filled them to the brim. He said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the steward of the feast. So they took it. When the steward of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it came from. Although the servants who had drawn it, drawn the water knew. The steward of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Every man serves the good wine first. But when men have drunk freely, then the poor wine, and then the poor wine. But you, you have kept the good wine until now. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee, and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him after this he went down to Capernaum with his mother and his brethren and his disciples and there they stayed for a few days the gospel of the Lord okay. so the wedding feast at Cana like I've been saying the Johannine corpus is full of rich symbolism. You will see that magnified if you ever sit down and read the book of Revelation. But in the opening chapters of John, you see all of these threads that are being picked at. Remember, chapter 1 starts off with the very first words of the Gospel of John. In the beginning. In fact, takes you back to Genesis. You see the word. The Logos, the Word, you see a progression of days. 
you see the idea of light and darkness, an introduction of a theme of water. You see certain uh, uh, reoccurring words, like in John's Gospel, the word hour. These things are very important. And when you see them in John's Gospel, a little light bulb should go off and say, I should circle this, this is important. This is here for a reason, okay? And so, like we said at the end of last week's class, the, go the wedding feast occurs on the seventh day of the opening sequence of John's Gospel. In Genesis, what happens on the seventh day? Rest. He rests. But in John's Gospel, he's not resting. In, in fact, it's the beginning. What does Jesus begin at Galilee? I mean, in, at the wedding feast at Cana. He begins his miracles. miracles, his public ministry. Right? He begins his public ministry. On the seventh day, God rested in Genesis, but now Jesus commences his public ministry. At the wedding feast, the bride and the bridegroom are not named. You notice that? They don't speak. We don't hear anything about them. But obviously... The occasion is important enough that not just Jesus is there. His mother and all his disciples are present there as well. In this narrative, Jesus refers to his mother as woman. And to our modern ears, this may sound disrespectful. But what John is showing, he's showing that once Jesus commences his public ministry, the proverbial cat is out of the bag. And Mary is no longer just Jesus' mother, but rather everyone's mother. Okay? So let's go back here for a second. Father, yes. Yes, we get a very good introduction to Mary in theology here. And the little bit that we see Mary in John's Gospel is very profound. So you know when the next time we see Mary in John's Gospel? We're not going to see her again for a long time. You're not going to see her to the foot of the cross. And she's not going to say anything. Her silence is very powerful. You're very good. When she falls silent, there's nothing more to be said. That's very good. But there's a reason why John is telling the story of the wedding feast at Cana in this way. Because we had just finished an allusion back to Genesis. Seven days in the beginning. Now, if you're familiar with the book of Genesis... You'd, be, you'd know that there's two creation narratives. God creates the universe twice. In chapters 1, and then again in 2 and 3. One is in the beginning. And there's the unfolding of the days. And then there's a second creation narrative. In which God creates man. Man is put to sleep. A rib is taken out of man. And life is breathed into them. And woman is created. That's in a different chapter. That does not happen in the same verses that we see in, in Genesis chapter 1. And so John, knowing this, kind of delves right into that. And we see a new Adam and a new Eve. The very first man and woman did not succeed in their task. And so... At the wedding feast at Cana, we see a new Adam and a new Eve. Who is the new Adam? And who is the new Eve? This is, this is very important. This gives context to what is going on. At this point, once Jesus begins his public ministry, no longer is Mary just his mother. She is the woman. She is the new Eve. And she is going to be the catalyst of the new covenant. So, 
the function this functions as a bookend. I mean, no, I missed that part. In John's rebuilding of Genesis in these opening chapters, the introduction of Jesus and Mary in chapter two shows that Jesus is the new Adam and Mary is the new Eve. Of course, Mary and Jesus are not married. However, this man and woman succeed where Adam and Eve failed. Eve prompted Adam to sin. However, here, the new Eve prompts the new Adam to commence his first miracle. The wedding feast is a prefigurement of what is about to unfold with Jesus. Okay? Who is the bridegroom? Jesus. And who is the bride? Church. We are. And so I don't want to go too much down this rabbit hole. But since John is so symbolic, and there's such richness in what he is writing, I don't know the answer to this, and it really doesn't matter. But what if there really wasn't a wedding feast to begin with? What if he was speaking in figurative language? And the wedding that he was talking about is the wedding feast that the church, us, has with Christ. Because this functions as a bookend. When's the next time we see Mary? On the cross. And what does Jesus say? Jesus tells Mary what? Woman, behold your son. And what does he tell John? Behold your mother. That dialogue is a direct reference to the wedding feast at Canaan. They're bookends. One happens in chapter twenty. One happens in chapter two, and the other happens in chapter nineteen. One happens at the beginning of Jesus' public ministry, and one happens moments before his death. Who does John the Beloved symbolize at the foot of the cross? Us, the church. The church. And Mary is given to us as our mother. And so we see that intimacy of a bride and her bridegroom. Christ is the bride, Christ is the bridegroom, and we are his bride. Yes. That's a bit of a jump, but you're good. You're, you're on the right track. So the church really doesn't officially start till Pentecost. But at this point, it's his public acts start to mean more. So this gives a context to what we're going to see in chapter 4 when he tells the official that you only want me to see this so you can believe in it. And we're going to see a lack of something happen when he heals uh his son. So the wedding feast at Cana is the first sign of the book of signs. There are seven signs, and this is the first one. Okay? And so that dialogue is very important. Now, who's ever been to a wedding that I've done? Have you heard my wedding homily? I'll give it to you real quick. I like to say this story. It's my favorite one. Uh, so I had a wedding this past Sunday. And I always tell the story at a wedding. And I always pick the wedding feast at Canaan because it's the easiest to preach on. <laughs> so, when I went to preach in school at Notre Dame about two, three years ago now, I heard this story, and it stuck with me. So, there is this young girl who was in high school. She was at Catholic high school. And she was in her English class, and it was the final exam. And... The exam was to rewrite the story of the wedding feast at Cana from the perspective of somebody else. So you could write it from the perspective of, say, the Blessed Mother, write it from the perspective of the servants, 
or perhaps the disciples, or perhaps the bride or the bridegroom. Rewrite the story and tell the story of the wedding feast at Cana from the perspective of one of the characters that we encounter. The girl in the corner was sitting there daydreaming, looking out the window, not doing the assignment. The teacher at, the teacher at her desk was just getting frustrated because she saw the girl not doing what she was supposed to do. The hour was clicking by, and as the hour came to its completion and the bell rang, the girl picked up her pen and wrote one sentence on the piece of paper. She picked up the, pen, pen, the paper and handed it into her teacher. The teacher was obviously frustrated and said, you know I'm gonna have to fail you. And the girl said, read it. And what she wrote was, and I turned to my master and I blushed. I turned to my master and I blushed. Who do you think she's talking about? Huh? You got it. I heard it. No. She's writing from the perspective of the water. Oh. I turned to my master and I blushed. Okay. Not that our Lord would serve a blush wine. Our Lord has a nicer taste than that, but nonetheless. <laughs> but nonetheless, that's, that gets to the point. I turned to my master and I blushed. Who else could she be writing from the perspective of? The bride. The bride. Explain. Well, because she never wanted to go. I would say she turned to her husband, the master, or the, the Lord. She turned to God. Because who was she to have God himself come to her wedding and perform this first miracle. And imagine how she felt when she found out that the wine was replenished by God himself. And I turned to my master and I blushed. And so I always tell the couple, mind you, before we receive communion, who are you to have God himself show up to your way? So the wedding feast is important. And when you do read the book of Revelation, there's one of my favorite, favorite hymns in the book of Revelation. How does it go? The wedding feast of the Lamb has begun, and his bride is prepared to welcome him. I can't think of it right now. The Lord, I can't think of it. But it's called the Canticle of the Lamb. The Canticle of the Lamb. It's in the book of Revelation. And one of my favorite lines is there. The wedding feast of the Lamb has begun. And his bride, us, is prepared to welcome him. And so you see these concepts, these ideas, these symbolism, just permeate and tie through every ounce of John's writing. Okay. All right. Now, we're not going to read it, but we don't, have, because we don't have time. But we're going to talk about it. The cleansing of the temple. You know what makes the cleansing of the temple unique in John's gospel? Or make this, makes the cleansing of the temple unique in general, I should say? Is that it's one of the only things, aside from like the crucifixion, that appears in all four gospels. None of the miracles of John's gospel appear in any of the other four Gospels. They're all unique to John's Gospel, with the exception of one miracle. There's only one miracle that appears in John's Gospel that appears in the other Gospels, and that's the feeding of the 5,000. All the other miracles are totally unique to the Gospel of John. There's not a retelling of them in the other Gospels. Now, the cleansing of the temple is the only incident, aside from like the crucifixion and the feeding of the 5,000, that we get in all 
four Gospels. Isn't that interesting? Okay. So, in John's Gospel, the cleansing of the temple occurs during a particular time. It occurs during the Passover. Okay, remember, in John's Gospel, the Jewish feasts are very important. I want you to turn to the last page of your notes. In John's Gospel, there are seven times in which a Jewish feast appears. Seven times that a Jewish feast appears. In chapter 2, in chapter 5, 6, twice in 7, 10, and 11. And we see our Lord journeying through these Jewish feasts. And the context of the feast is often very much significant to what is going on here. Now, they're not necessarily tied one to one, but we again, we see another symbolism of the number seven. How many signs are there? Seven signs. Now, the signs and the feasts are not necessarily directly tied, but yet we see seven signs and we see seven feasts. We saw seven days in creation. So that's not there by accident, I'll tell you that. So. The very first feast that we encounter, obviously, is the Feast of Passover. Jesus is in Jerusalem during Passover, and many are beginning to believe in him. But he hasn't revealed himself to many people at this time. It is important for us to know that Passover always refers us back to Exodus, the very first Passover. The night when the Lord's angel passed over the Jews because, because of the blood of the Lamb. It is also important to connect Passover with John 3 and Jesus' discussion with Nicodemus. Because what, we'll get to that in a second, but Nicodemus is talking about baptism. And we see the first prefigurement of baptism in Exodus. Because what does water do in Exodus? It cleanses, but who does it cleanse? Or how does it cleanse? What does it kill? Huh? No, but what does water kill? Who drowns? The Egyptians. And the Egyptians are a symbolism for sin. Okay? So, Passover's key. So, at the end, in the middle or end of chapter 2, Jesus takes us, John takes us to Passover. So Passover is one of the high holy days for the Jewish people. And thus it is a bold statement to say that Jesus is going to cleanse the temple during the most sacred time for the Jews. Okay? Of all the time of the year to clean the temple. In John's Gospel, Jesus does it during the Feast of Passover. Again, bold statement. Apologize for my grammar. I wrote these real quick. So... When you read my notes, I apologize for my grammar. But Jesus is purifying the temple on Passover. Because Passover is sacred for the Jews, is it not? And so if Jesus is going, it would be like Jesus coming back now, telling all of us we're doing a terrible job, and decided to come clean house during the sacred treaty. So, he's making a statement. Uh, so, this is the first of the seven Jewish feasts mentioned in John's Gospel. Both the first and the last occur, and the middle occur during Passover. I'm going to say that. The first, the first time we see a Jewish feast is in chapter 2. And then, and that's what the, and then we see the last Jewish feast occur uh, at the end, I believe, of chapter 12. And that's the last time we hear a mention of the Jewish feast. So the Book of Signs kind of opens at Passover, and then the Book of Signs closes at Passover. Again, you see how things are nicely organized. They're there for a reason. So, again, like I said, when, by simply the mentioning of the word Passover, it pulls us back into Exodus when the Hebrews passed dry shod through the Red Sea. 
Bonus question. I know there's a there's a, a boot company that makes that's named after this. Does anyone know what dry shod means? There's a boot company called Dry Shod. That's a good hint. When you pass dry shod, it's a fancy way of saying that your feet don't get wet. <laughs> so pass dry shod through the Red Sea, meaning um, not even the feet of the Hebrews got wet. So the cleansing of the temple is kind of aggressive, isn't it? And so it shows an aggressive nature to Jesus as well. Jesus is actively trying to do something. Jesus is actively trying to supersede the old with the new. Although he discusses destroying the temple, that is held in tension with rebuilding. Meaning, our Lord did not just come to topple the social order. You're going to hear people try to, you know, turn Jesus into a communist and into a Marxist. Where Jesus came to overthrow the social order and promote revolution. No, that's not the case. He did not come to overthrow. He came to restore, repair, and to, most importantly... Fulfill, And so although this may sound a little aggressive, he is putting it in context of himself. Because he says, you know, I'm going to come back and the temple is going to be destroyed and be rebuilt in three days. And they say it took 46 years to build the temple. What is he talking about? His body. He's talking about himself. Because now the temple is no longer a what, but a who. Again, a contrast, a dichotomy that you need to remember. Sometimes you need, we're going from a what to a who. And we got that in the very beginning of the beginning of John's gospel because the word was made flesh. It became a who. Okay. So destroying of the temple and rebuilding. Jesus is not about to abolish but rather to restore and make right and bring to fulfillment everything that has failed thus far. And thus his cleaning. His cleaning is more of a, a restoration. And his reference to three days, like I said, obviously is not a reference to the physical old temple, but rather to something more glorious, his own body. The temple, like I said, is no longer just a what, but rather a who. Okay. Bit of a soapbox here. Granted, we're Catholics, so we don't necessarily think in this way. But there's a lot of Protestants who believe that the temple needs to be rebuilt. And so there's a lot of Christians that are really invested in the Holy Land. And I don't totally understand it. Now, the Holy Land is very important to us as well. That is where all the sacred places are. However, if you think that the temple needs to be rebuilt, they're totally missing the point. The temple has already been rebuilt. Who is the temple? Jesus. Jesus. And we're the temple. We're the new temple, the church. It's already been rebuilt. There could be the whole Holy Land. We don't want this to happen. But it could be totally destroyed by nuclear war. And it wouldn't matter because the temple has already been rebuilt. Because the temple is not a what. It is a who. Very important to remember. Some of our uh, other Christian brethren don't necessarily make that jump. Okay. All right. So let's move on. We're moving on to chapter 3. Let's read a little bit of chapter 3. Am I behind time? No. Oh. Questions, comments, funny stories? Anything? <coughs> okay. So Nicodemus. We'll just read the first part of the building. Now there was a man of the... Man... There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born anew, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, 
you must be born anew. The wind blows where it wills, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes, uh, where it goes. So it is with everyone who is reborn of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can this be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand this? See, our Lord, he's good. So you're a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand this. Truly I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one can ascend into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Whoever believes in him may have eternal life. And then we get to the most famous verse in all of Scripture. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Okay. So Nicodemus, again, context. If you read a little closely from chapters 2 to chapter 3, right after the cleansing of the temple, we're still in and near and around the Feast of Passover. This very well could have happened later that night after the cleansing of the temple. Okay. Who runs the temple? The Pharisees. Okay. So, put this into context. Nicodemus is a Pharisee. And the temple just got cleaned. Okay. And they essentially all just got told off. And most of the other Pharisees are probably pretty bad, and we're going to see later on that they really don't like our Lord. But Nicodemus is different. He comes at night, not during the day, at night. And he's intrigued. And then he has this conversation that we just read. So, Nicodemus, a Pharisee, who's, he is trying to understand who Jesus is. This conversation occurs during the Passover, after the cleansing of the temple. Nicodemus comes from the old order, right? He is a symbol of the old power for the people. This is how it was. He is a symbol of that. He, has, he is a, uh, a Jewish leader. He has great authority. He represents the old order. And very well could have participated in the decay of the temple. He could have been one of the reasons why the temple needed to be clean. He could have been one of the movers and shakers who are saying, you know, you money changers, you need to be doing this. We don't know. Thus, Nicodemus' conversation with Jesus is pivotal. It shows that Jesus is not out to abolish the old, but rather to restore it. Since this conversation is occurring during Passover, just like the cleansing of the temple, it brings us back to Exodus. Nicodemus is inquiring about how to be born again. Recall during the Exodus, it was the firstborn son who was killed during the Passover. Now Nicodemus, now for Nicodemus to be reborn, Jesus says that it must be through water and the Spirit. Here, water is an allusion to cleansing. For a Jew like Nicodemus, especially during the Passover, water is a direct allusion to the Hebrews passing through the Red Sea. If it's Passover, and Jesus brings up the idea of water, this is immediately making him think about the Exodus. And the water coming to destroy Pharaoh and the Egyptians. Jesus tells Nicodemus that he is not out to destroy the world, but to save the world insofar as God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Like I said last week, the word world has two meanings in John's gospel. A positive meaning and a negative meaning. Anybody recall what these are? What's the positive meaning of the word world? The world, think of Genesis. God creates and it is good. But also the world is what? Evil. There's a dual meaning to the world, world. And here we see that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. 
and the sun will be lifted up like a, on a piece of wood, just like Moses lifted up the servant, serpent in the wilderness. So do you see how there is a direct parallel between what's going on here and what goes on in Exodus? This is what John's trying to point out. If you recall from last week, we established what the Torah is. What is the Torah? The first five books of the Bible. Anyone want to take a stab at them? Numbers, Leviticus. So it shouldn't be surprised that John's going to make a direct reference to what's going on for the Jewish people. And they know these books very, very well. So we're going to see references to Genesis and to Exodus in particular. Okay? Is, is, is this the chapter where the born-again Christian came from? That's sure. I, 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 would, I would believe so, that you must be born again. I mean, we believe that too. Yeah. At baptism, we are born again. And we're, we're, that's why, that's why, liturgically, your baptism and your funeral look almost identical. Because you're, you're in the Christian order, death is the condition of life. At baptism, we are dying and rising again. At your funeral, God willing, that we pray that you're going to die and rise again. That's why at your baptism, you're wrapped in a white garment. At your funeral, your casket is wrapped in the white garment, the pall. You are sprinkled with water at baptism. We sprinkle you with water. And in fact, at the funeral, we say, through the waters of baptism. The funeral ritual and the baptismal ritual mirror each other. At the baptismal ritual, we light the big, tall paschal candle. Guess what we do at your funeral? We light the big, tall paschal candle. There is a reason why that is so. Because in the Christian order, death is the condition of life. We die so that we can rise again. Okay. All right, and then we go, like uh, was said earlier, Jesus, they go about baptizing. Them. Let's skip to the woman at the left. We're in a little low on time, a little short on time today. <coughs> Chapter 4. So I'm going to read the first few verses, and then I'm going to skip a few verses. So... Now the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was, was making and baptizing more disciples than John. Although Jesus himself did not baptize, only his disciples. He left Judea and departed again to Galilee. He had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria called Sychar, near the field of, that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. And so Jesus wearied as he, Jesus, so Jesus wearied as he was with his journey sat down beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. Okay. Jacob's well. Where do we first find Jacob's well? What book of the Bible? Mm -hmm. Now? Genesis. Genesis. Uh, my Old Testament isn't too good, but who was Jacob's father? No. That was his grandfather, Isaac. Who was Isaac's father? Abraham. So Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So this is this pulls us back straight to the Old Testament. Okay. Mm -hmm. So they're at Jacob's well. Okay. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, "Give me drink," for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him. How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman from Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it was that was saying to you, Give me drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where do you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well and drank from it himself and his sons and his cattle? Jesus said to him, Everyone who drinks this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks the water that I shall give will never thirst. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst, nor come here to draw. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, 
I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right in saying I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and he whom you now have is not your husband. This is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. For salvation is from the Jews. Okay. A lot going on there. A lot going on. First off, what sticks out? She never did anything to drink. <laughs> never did give anything to drink. <laughs> There's our literalist. But was Jesus even thirsty? Probably not. He kind of was. But was he thirsty for water? He was thirsting for her. Exactly. Okay. So let's break this open. Let's think, think. Location. Jacob's well. Very important. Okay. Uh, time of day. Noon. The sixth hour. That makes it so much better. That makes it so much better. And uh, why do you think it's the sixth hour? We'll just go straight there. Why would a woman not go get water in the morning when it's cool? Because the other women are there. What do, what do they like to do? Gossip. And what is she probably embarrassed of? Her husband's. See? Things never change. And so, yes. We get this allusion to water. Like I've been saying, water is very significant for the Jewish people. When they hear this, the ears perk up, okay? Yes. So she said that she referred to the father of Jacob. So were the Samaritans or like the Protestants like the Jacob and the Jews? Kind of. Kind of. We'll get into it. They, they, they thought the Jews kind of lost their way. They were more, I don't know if you know what this term is, they were more like, like the Cide Vacantes of the time. They think that the Jews have lost their way and that there's no real church anymore and they all just kind of do their own thing. I think that's a brief, I wouldn't call them Protestants. They just thought they were lost. They were lost. And so they didn't get along with the Jews. Okay? They were once Jews, but they thought that they kind of had lost connection with the cup. Okay. So, here, uh, like I said, the image of water continues. Jesus progresses to an area, Samaria, where the people struggle to believe in God because they think the faith has been corrupted. Samaritans essentially believe that Judaism and the Jewish Torah have been corrupted by time and no longer serve the duties God mandated on Mount Sinai. Obviously, the Pharisees would disagree with this. Jesus goes to the well, a very important well, Jacob's well, and encounters a Samaritan woman and asks her, Give me drink. The Samaritan woman, knowing the conflict between the Jews and the Samaritans, is confused by Jesus' request. Jesus, standing next to Jacob's well, begins to talk about living water that can quench all thirst. The woman does not seem to understand what Jesus is talking about. Being plagued with sin, she is confused. So Jesus changes his approach. He makes a direct reference to her infidelity and the infidelity of the Jewish people. The Jews were unfaithful to the Old Testament covenant. So her serial adultery is a sign of infidelity. Okay? All right. Who was unfaithful? The Jews at this point. They had broken the covenant. All right? And even the Samaritans. He tells her, go tell your husband. And she responds by saying she does not have a husband. Jesus corrects her and tells her that she has been unfaithful and that she has had five husbands. And the man that she is currently living with now is not her husband. This is a total of six men. Six failed relationships. Six failed covenants. See where we're going with this? Jesus is pointing out that she is just like the Jewish people in her infidelity. The seventh man in her life, Jesus, the seventh covenant, 
is the new covenant that can wash and quench her thirst. Obviously, she is embarrassed. And so I love this part. I love this part. Jesus says, go tell your husband. I don't have a husband. You're right. You don't have one husband. You have had five husbands. And he who you are currently living with now is not your husband. You know what she says? Can't use the subject. Well, I, aren't you a prophet? <laughs> and then she changes the subject. She doesn't start talking about her husband. She asks about liturgy. She asks about worship. She says, no, 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 no. Let's not talk about this. Let's talk about worship. Where shall we worship? Shall we worship in the temple of the Jews do? Or shall we worship in the side of the mountain as the Samaritans do? She compares the Samaritans to the Jews in this thing. Where shall we worship? And Jesus tells her that salvation comes from the Jews, but that there is an hour coming when true followers will worship in spirit and truth. What is he referencing? Good Friday. This is, a, this is, this is getting to the point where Jesus is not just for the Jews. Jesus is coming for all people. That a new temple is being rebuilt for both Gentile and Jew. These delineations are going to fall away. And that when you are baptized by, by water and the Holy Spirit, something new happens. I don't know if you ever heard during Sunday preface one of ordinary time, you hear me say, summoning us to the glory of being now called a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. What am I referring to as the chosen race? Jews. No, not now. Not after, not after Easter Sunday. The chosen race is all of those who have been baptized. And so what was this mark of Judaism, circumcision? That's no longer the case. What's the new indelible mark? What's the mark that cannot be taken away from you? Baptism. Baptism. And so the mark of the chosen race is baptism. And that is open to everyone who wills, who wants it. And so that's, this is pointing to that as well. He has come to save the Samaritans from a lifetime of struggle from five pagan gods and saving the Jewish people from their own infidelity. Meaning, he is tying them all together and is saying that I can save you all. Anybody who's been in, in unfaithful, not just the Jewish people, not just the Samaritans, we're all thirsting for something. And our... Thirst can only be quenched in not a what, but a who. It's not what water, it's who, Jesus. He is the living water. Okay. A who is the answer to a lot of these questions. All right, so let's move on. So we're in chapter four at the end, and we get to the second sign. And the second sign of the book of sign is that Jesus heals the official son. Jesus returns to Canaan. His first journey following the first sign is brought full circle. There was a royal officer who heard of Jesus. So this happens in Cana. Where did, where did chapter 2 open up? In Cana, at the wedding feast. So the first sign happened in Cana, and it just so happens that the second sign happens in Cana. And the official, the royal official, heard of Jesus. Here he infers that they heard a word. And where, what does word infer? What does that bring us back to? <coughs> Jesus. But what part of John? John chapter 4. In the beginning was the word. And the word made flesh. So, so if, you don't, if you don't pick it up when you read it, it's there. Because obviously it talks about the official hearing about Jesus, which means he had to hear about the word. We hear words. And thus a direct tie in the prologue of chapter 1. In the beginning was the word. It was the word that brought the official from disbelief to belief. Upon hearing that Jesus has returned to Cana, he, become, he approaches Jesus and begged him to heal his son. 
Jesus at first appears to refuse to help, but after the official's persistence, Jesus tells him, your son will live. Note that there is no healing action. There is no laying on of hands. There's no what's called the theandric action. A theandric action in sacred scripture is when the human side and the divine side of Jesus work together. We'll see this later on in John's Gospel when Jesus spits and makes clay and rubs it on the, per or rubs it on the person. That's a theandric action where the human side and the divine side of Jesus are cooperating. This is not what's called the theandric action. Jesus simply says, your son will live. Jesus says, which means Jesus is saying words. And Jesus is healing by the word. And therefore, the second sign is that the word heals. The word. That? Sure, yeah, probably. So do you get that jump? How this is showing that Jesus is the word and that the word heals, uppercase W. And so by having to hear the words, Jesus just states it to be so. The word says, and it is, there's no healing action. Jesus doesn't lay hands. He just says it. And then you keep reading the passage and he realizes that his son was saved. And he asked, what time did it happen? And the official realized, well, that was the exact same time that Jesus declared it to be so. Okay? The second sign. Any questions? Clear as mud? Okay. The third sign, chapter 5. <clears throat> Jesus heals on the Sabbath. So, immediately following the healing of the official son, which is at the end of chapter 4, we start at the beginning of chapter 5. And again, he heals again. And now we change feasts, though. Jesus is in Jerusalem during a special Jewish feast. And we know that that feast is the Feast of Weeks. So go to your back page, and these are the feasts. So, the Feast of Weeks. Has anyone ever heard about the Feast of Weeks? Okay. So the Feast of Weeks is the second of the three solemn feasts that all Jewish males are required to travel to Jerusalem to attend. Where does this third sign occur? Jerusalem. In Jerusalem. Signs one and two occurred where? In Canaan. Canaan. Now, new Jewish feast, the Feast of Weeks, and Jesus has to travel to Jerusalem. And so the third sign occurs in Jerusalem. The, since, the, the, since the Feast of Weeks was the one of the harvest feast, the Jews were commanded to present an offering of new grain to the Lord. The Feast of Weeks takes place exactly 50 days after the Feast of Fruits. Okay, So these are the two harvest feasts. One at the beginning, one at the end. 50 days in between. Okay, This should perk up our ears. What do we celebrate 50 days after an important feast? Pentecost. Okay. So do you know what the Feast of Weeks is also called? The Jewish Feast of Pentecost. Okay. It normally occurs in late spring, either the last part of May or the beginning of June. Unlike other feasts that began on the specific day of the Hebrew calendar, this one is calculated by 50 days after the seventh Sabbath day. Ain't that very similar to how we calculate Pentecost? Because what does penta mean? Five. Five, 50 weeks. 50 days. Okay. All right. So, the third sign occurs in Jerusalem on a special feast, which is the Feast of Weeks. Both the place and time are important to Jewish people. Here he encounters blind, lame, paralyzed individuals. One man was sick for 38 years. 38 years is important because this is a direct reference to something else. This man symbolizes the Jewish people who wandered in the wilderness of Kadesh for 38 years as a punishment. So if you know your Old Testament, the wilderness of Kadesh, 
They wanted for 38 years. And so this man has been ill for 38 years, which is an allusion to the fact that he's surrounded by all these people who are deaf, blind, and invalid. That who is... What am I saying? Who is this man a symbol of? Us, the Jewish people, or, or the followers who have lost sight. We have become blind. We have become invalid. We have become uh, lame and paralyzed in our faith. So when Jesus asked the man, do you want to be healed? It is as if he is asking the Jewish people if they want to be healed. Again, Jesus healed with his word. And he does so on the Sabbath day. By doing so, he is breaking Jewish law. But yet, like I said, Jesus did not come to break the law or to overturn the law, but rather to fulfill the law. And thus the third sign is that the word is greater than the law. And then immediately following the healing, Jesus establishes authority at the end of chapter 5. Here we see Jesus, the word, state where he gets his authority from, the Father. By calling God his Father, Jesus claims to have an equality with God as a divine sonship. If the Father was the one that promulgated the law, Jesus is of equal authority to the Father. Then the word that God speaks is therefore equal to or greater than the law. For the Jewish people hearing this, who valued the law, John is saying that Jesus is the completion and answer of everything they have been waiting for. Now, I'm sure some of the people who heard this weren't comfortable hearing this, but nonetheless, this is what John is trying to say. Because who is John writing to? To Christians. The Christians who have been already converted from Judaism. Not so much converted. Conversion is not the right word. Because usually conversion means that you turn away from something. That's not what happened here. That's why I, I don't like referring, even though the church calls it this. To me, it doesn't make sense. The conversion of John the Baptist. I mean, the conversion of St. Paul. It doesn't make sense. Because Paul didn't turn away from anything. Paul simply became a fulfilled Jew. He didn't reject his Jewish roots. He didn't suddenly, you know, stop believing it. He just realized... That it was fulfilled. And so it's like Judaism 2.0. It wasn't nullified. It, he's not turned his back on it. But rather it's seen everything in its context brought to fulfillment. So if you would have asked St. Paul. Paul in his own mind probably would think of himself as a fulfilled Jew. The covenant's been fulfilled. We should all want this. And so this delineation between Christians and the Jews at this point can be a little difficult because sometimes we try to put them like, you know, you have to stop believing in one to believe in the other. No, no, no. It's taking what you believed in the Judaism and bringing it all to fulfillment and seeing how Jesus is what you've been waiting for for centuries. He has been what's promised since the very beginning. All of this has been in the works since the very beginning. And thus, John starts his gospel by saying what? In the beginning. He's trying to show them that this isn't new. This has been planned since the very beginning. God has willed this since literally day one. Does that make any sense? No. Okay. And I think that's all I have. Even it's early. Any questions, comments? Can we start all of this in the beginning? No, I'm recording it. It's on the way to our webs. It's going to be on the website. I'll have that up by tomorrow. Uh, but now you have to do your homework. Now we're going to do, I think, chapter 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. We've got five chapters this week, I believe. Yes. Has it been beneficial having to actually go through the gospel readings in a linear fashion? Not just going from uh, passage to passage. Any questions, comments? Before we wrap up?
Have you learned anything? Okay. Is this too over our head? Or is it at a, at a, at a digestible level? Why does uh, in the gospels, why does uh, Jesus always say double, like truly, truly, and amen, amen? Why well, no, That's mainly in John's gospel. I think. I think it's to show emphasis. I think it's to, to show that he means business. I don't know the answer. Yeah, I noticed that. Very different. He's just—it's very different. He's very, he's very blunt. There's no other way. There's no other way around. And it's kind of funny sometimes. Like as we keep on reading, you're going to see some one-liners that are just great. Like, go tell your husband. Or, you only want this because you want to see to believe. Um, or what he tells Nicodemus. Um, what did he say? About not him not believing or something like that. He's just very blunt. Very, very blunt. The way John builds up Jesus' personality in John's gospel. It's awesome. And like you'll see it again at what are my favorite. I know if you've been to my funerals, you've heard my uh, Raisin of Lazarus homily. And I absolutely love the Raisin of Lazarus because John says twice, twice, that Jesus gets perturbed. Yet again, Jesus gets perturbed. He makes note of that twice in the Raisin of Lazarus. Jesus also asked Nicodemus, are you are you don't know this and you're a teacher for Yeah, Israel. Jesus is like, you're a Pharisee. You should know this. You should be teaching me. Why? Come on, you tell me what this means. He challenges them. So, and then in the cleansing of the temple, too. Jesus goes in there and means business. He does so on the Passover. Like, that's not an insignificant time to be cleaning the temple. So, it there's some boldness in John's gospel when you start to kind of cipher stuff like that. Yes, well, I mean that he adds, but in, in John's gospel, that's not a secret. There's not the, there's no messianic. If you notice, there's not a messianic secret in John's gospel. Some of the synoptic you see, synoptic you see Jesus, shh, don't tell him, don't tell him. You don't see any of that in John's gospel. John, Jesus is in charge from day one. He's coming out. He's in, he's in charge of things. He has a very high Christology. Jesus is, you know, there's no messianic secret in John's gospel. But yeah, that's good. Shall we pray? Yes. Who wants to lead us in the closing? <coughs> Someone want to volunteer? If not, I will volunteer. <laughs> So it can, I'm sure you've prayed before, I hope. <laughs> okay. Okay. I need to do it. Okay. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Dear Lord, thank you for bringing all of these people together, but mostly thank you for bringing Father Jacob to us and letting us take the time to teach us the Gospel of John and to, to help us to learn The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go in peace. Take care.